stunned to see so many people here, and I'm told actually that nearly as many again were turned away. So I'm, I'm actually very impressed to see so many of you here um, concerned about the sorts of issues we're talking about this morning. I was asked to talk about options available for management of urban populations of ungulates. And really, um, what I want to try and do is to talk about the approaches used in other continental European countries. I've worked quite a lot in other countries within the EU. And have picked up some experience from there. So I want to look at what they are doing, if anything, or are they ignoring the problem? I want to look at what's being done in the United States, where for once they're actually perhaps slightly ahead of us in their concerns for problems with urban wildlife. And possibly, for once, we might learn something from them. I'll try and uh, keep it as non-technical possible. If you get bored of the talk or bored of looking at my face, some of the pictures are quite nice. Um, in all cases, I have attributed the source in the bottom right-hand corner usually. If, if there is no attribution, the picture's mine. So I've had to steal some off the internet. But to put it in context, the first thing you're all aware of, and I'm slightly uh, conscious of, of teaching granny to suck eggs in some of this. Right across Europe, the majority of species of deer and other ungulates like wild boar are increasing in numbers and are expanding their ranges. Now that is happening at the same time. See if I can manage more. That is happening at the same time as urban development expands into their landscape. And urban development is the most rapidly expanding land use change in Europe. It's predicted that expansion of towns and cities will continue at about 0.7% per year. Now that's 10 times the speed of any other form of land use change. So clearly, there is a real potential for conflict between human activities and wildlife. Now, in the UK, we've been aware of the problem of urban foxes that's been recognised and publicised and widely studied for many years. It's comparatively recently that we've actually recognised that deer of various species are also now increasing in numbers in our towns and cities. Initially, they came as occasional visitors, but now we've got widely established populations of them. Muckjack, row, that's actually just taken outside my bedroom window. So, and I don't know what happened to its antlers. I really don't know what happened to its antlers. And there are uh, populations established in Edinburgh, Glasgow, <coughs> and a number of cities south of the border. And in a number of cases now actually fallow are getting into <coughs> urban areas. Red deer and seeker deer have also been reported, but I think in no cases are they really resident. Actually, you don't know how lucky you are, because wild boar populations, although they now occur within Scotland and the rest of the UK, have expanded very rapidly in many European countries in recent decades, even to the extent that the problem of urban boar was raised in the European Parliament in 2012. While boar actually have now occur in 44 cities or towns in 15 countries within Europe. Okay, what are the problems? This is very much by way of introduction and I apologise if it overlaps with earlier talks. What are the problems we may have with urban populations or increased urbanisation of populations of ungulates. There's concern in relation to damage to gardens and urban parks, particularly with wild boar rooting up your daffodils. Structural damage to fences. People are particularly aware of 
the problem of road traffic accidents. It's a seeker and it's in Japan and I suspect it's photoshopped. But when you look at the people, they're looking at something. And there are real concerns, even if misplaced concerns, about the possibility of deer and wild boar uh, becoming involved in transmission of diseases, both to humans and their domestic pets. And I want to look through those sort of very quickly as, as, as a way of background to look at those potential conflicts, and then we will start to look at the solutions which have been offered. So, collisions with vehicles. <coughs> yes, they occur all over the UK, and yes, they occur in rural areas as much as they occur in towns and cities. Indeed, you would think the bulk of road traffic accidents involving deer in the UK would be in rural areas. In fact, you probably most of you know of a project that Jochen Langbein and I undertook um, for, at that time, the Deer Commission for Scotland and the Highways Agency in England, looking at the distribution of uh, roadkill, road traffic accidents involving deer, and relating it to various ecological factors to see if we could identify things which could predict and advance a likely hotspot so that we could take appropriate action in mitigation. And in fact, if you look at all those data, it's really bizarre that while you would think that the bulk of incidents would occur in rural areas, 44% of, we logged somewhere in excess of 40,000 deer vehicle collisions, 44% of those fall within one mile of a city centre. And that's slightly scary, because it means it's not a rural problem at all, it's a suburban and peri-urban problem. 44% of those accidents occurring in what we might loosely call the peri-urban area. So it's an issue. There is an issue we've already described of people being concerned about damage to gardens or damage to parks, or in this particular case, damage in a war cemetery. In the area where I live, there are frequent complaints because red deer jump into the graveyards and eat the floral tributes left by grieving relatives. And in many cases, uh, it's falsely considered to be the work of vandals, and people get terribly up in arms. How on earth could people desecrate such, such a sacred site and my, my, my Uncle Tommy's grave? Whereas, in fact, the deer are getting in at night and, and eating and scattering the flowers. But it does cause people's distress, <coughs> some distress. And actually, curiously, many of, the, many of the problems we have with deer in urban areas and with wild boar in urban areas are more a matter of perception than reality. So that there is a perception that it will increase, I don't know if I've actually got it will actually increase the probability of you contracting Lyme disease or your domestic uh, cats or your domestic dogs contracting some other vile parasite burden. In fact, there's relatively little evidence to suggest, for a start, the story of uh, deer and and their role in the transmission of Lyme disease is a complicated one. Deer are actually not competent hosts for the spirochete bacteria which causes Lyme disease. If deer get infected, their antibodies effectively kill the Borrelia parasite. So while they may be involved in transmission of tick, and even that gets slightly complicated because the main vectors are small rodents, mice and voles, and actually small birds. Deer may be involved in some way in distributing tick populations around. Their role in the transmission of Lyme disease is actually pretty peripheral if they are really involved at all. And in the same way, actually, concerns that there was a study done by Alain Lecoq in Belgium, across Belgium and neighboring countries in Europe, 
and their survey suggested that people were really concerned about urban populations of wild boar because of the perception that there would be health implications in terms of transmission to disease, although in fact the current studies which have been undertaken suggest that those impacts are, at least currently, not significant at all. So, okay, quick overview of what people are worried about. And as I say, in a lot of cases, they're worried rather than that there is a real reason for concern. What are we going to do about it? I actually undertook a survey on behalf of the EU of deer populations, and there's a parallel one being done for wild boar, of deer populations in the larger cities in the main European countries, so Germany, Austria, France, Belgium, so on and so forth, to see what, would, what was actually going on and what were the management approaches being taken by uh, those charged with dealing with issues of urbanisation of wild ungulates. And the answer is nothing much within Europe. In effect, in most countries, as in the UK, the problem, if it is a problem, of urban ungulates is a comparatively recent one. It's something that's actually only raised its, its head above the parapet in the last uh, 10, 20, 25 years. And most people haven't caught up with it as a problem. In most cases, actually, management of deer carries on in the peri-urban area, the peripheral area, the rural countryside around towns and cities, controlling numbers in rural areas, and hoping that that will reduce the source population for colonisation of urban fringe and urban areas, because they really don't want to know what to do if they do get in. But it's actually quite important that we take this seriously, and I know you do, because it's important that we act quite quickly, because once deer do get into urban areas, their populations can expand really quite fast. Uh, for example, in Barcelona, captures of wild boar for relocation, and we'll come on to that in a minute, grew from fewer than five cases a year to 50 a year, in a period of five years only. So the pop and that wasn't simply because they got better at trans catching and translocating them, simply there were many more boar to be dealt with in Barcelona over a five year period. So if you don't get on top of it very quickly, then you're actually storing up a real problem for the future. Since we have our SNH colleagues here, may I have permission to use your son? Actually, it's not. It's the Dear Commission for Scotland, but I'm sure you can find Best practice guidance. In rural areas, and you're all doing this... Oh, dare I tell you again? Yes, I will tell you a funny story. Um, in rural areas, culling with a high-powered rifle is obviously the way of choice. It's a generally accepted method of controlling numbers of ungulates in the context of wildlife management. But as you know, discharge of a high-velocity weapon in a built-up area not only poses problems of safety, but also legality. And in addition, lethal control of wildlife in rural areas, and in particularly in urban areas, often meets opposition from people who actually quite like the idea of having deer in their neighbourhood. They actually quite like waking up in the morning and looking out the window, and there's a fallow buck wandering down the street. So, being less aware of the problems that that may pose, many, many people are opposed to killing them and are looking for alternatives. <coughs> the reason for the humour is because I recently submitted a report to uh, an organisation which had better remain nameless, explaining that uh, culling by deer in rural areas was largely by high velocity rifle, but a shotgun could be used in special circumstances where deer were seen to be causing damage to agriculture. You all know the law damage to agriculture, damage to uh, forestry, or other public 
dangerous, you may use a shotgun in certain circumstances. And the comment I got back was, I thought you could sh that, that hunting people or stalking people could shoot at any time and anywhere in the open season in the interest of sport, and there was no distinction made between the fact that that is with a high-velocity rifle, and I had simply said, a shotgun may be used, and they confused the two. <coughs> but if we're not going to have lethal control, what are the options? And the options really are capture, either by trapping or by darting them with a tranquilizing rifle, for translocation and release elsewhere, capture for uh, humane dispatch, that's not a non-lethal, but it's at least out of the public eye, <coughs> and usually requiring capture, fertility control to stop populations expanding. And it's those that I really want to, to <coughs> talk about. Uh, in the rest of this talk, and I want to actually talk about the costs and consequences of each of them. So what about translocation? A lot of people who are opposed to the idea of culling animals at all, and certainly uh, would object to this being carried out even in safe zones within urban areas, perhaps within parkland, public parks from a high seat, ways in which you can make it relatively safe. A lot of them would advocate translocation. Relatively little has been published on the effectiveness of live capture and translocation of deer in Europe, but we do know quite a lot from the United States. And it's not as simple as people would think. For a start, a very large proportion of translocated animals, unless they are translocated a very considerable distance, and we're talking 20 to 50 miles and more, spend a lot of time and effort trying to get back to where they were captured and removed from. Many of them actually die in consequence. They are killed on the road. <coughs> They wander through the home ranges of, people, of animals already established who chivvy them on because they're unfamiliar with the ge local geography to which they have been displaced. They may not be able to forage effectively. <coughs> it's a very, re very good review carried out by Giovanna Massa and published uh, a couple of years ago which looks at a lot of these problems and we can pick some of them up later if you want to in questions. But the net result is, at least from all the studies which have been taken in the States, 90% of translocated animals die within one year of release. So you might as well shoot them. Sorry, did I display a bias? <laughs> Sorry, I'm factual and un unbiased. But, it, but in essence, if by catching and moving these animals, you are causing a welfare issue, you are causing distress, you are causing stress, and ultimately these animals are likely to die anyway, it does raise a question whether or not this is a sensible thing to do. Many of you will be aware that there is much mortality associated with the initial capture anyway, and that's something we will come on to when we start talking about contraception in that as uh, post-capture myopathy, uh, as, as a stress traumatic response to being caught and handled in a number of species of deer, roe deer are particularly susceptible, so are sika, so are Chinese water deer, they develop what in common parlance is often called white muscle disease. It's a, a wasting of the muscle, the skeletal muscles of the limbs, the animals go down and become recumbent and die within uh, two or three days maximum of capture. So that's another particular problem, as well as this possibility that they are killed as they try to get back to their home range. The other issue which is raised by Masai in her review is that, of course, translocation of animals to new areas could be uh, quite a problem um, in its implication of transmission of disease 
from one deer population <coughs> to another. The costs are also very significant. As I say, we have relatively little information from uh, anywhere in Europe on this. And there have been surprisingly few attempts to calculate the costs even in the US, but I came up with uh, three figures, which we'll look at again later. And the estimate is the cost of translocation each deer varies between something like 430 US dollars to 1200 US dollars <coughs> per animal. Now, I appreciate that people don't like seeing deer being shot, but the cost of a bullet is somewhat lower. I couldn't actually find a slide of a contraceptive dose for deer, so you have to have a, a suckling bow kit instead. Now, a lot of people get really hung up on this, and they think this is the magic bullet that if we can stop populations of animals from breeding or we can suppress breeding, that is a much more humane way of controlling populations. The first thing to remember is that it doesn't actually reduce populations. Not immediately. It simply stops them increasing by reproduction. They can still increase by immigration, and that's where most of our urban populations have come from. Animals walking in along railway lines, walking in along uh, green lanes into city centres. So you're not tackling that, nor are you effecting a reduction in the number of deer present in the population. That will only happen thereafter through natural wastage and therefore mortality, natural mortality. So you are not actually reducing the population in the short term, although in the longer term it may show some decline. You can achieve contraception, for ungulates it's a waste of time trying to sterilise males. And again, a cautionary tale in a deer park where I used to work, they were worried as a fallow deer park, they had a very much scattered fawning season and they were losing a lot of fawns to foxes and also simple curiosity from other females going over to look at the latest fawn because there was only one. So what they did was they caught up all the males and they took them out and they put them all back in again, bang, first of September because then they would get a synchronised rut and synchronised fawning or so they thought. They'd missed one pricket who had very short spikes and they hadn't seen him. And on his own, he impregnated 230 adult females. <laughs> so you're wasting your time trying to sterilise males, unless you get the whole lot of them. And even for females, you have to effectively contracept, there is such a word I checked, you have effectively to contracept in excess of 80% of the population if you are going to have an effect on population size in the long term. <coughs> Now you can do it by catching and surgical uh, castration of females, you don't castrate females. You can do it by hormonal treatments, but the most commonly advocated, I think partly because it's buzzy and it sounds good, the thing that people are latching onto at the moment is this immunocontraception. It sounds terribly technical and terribly clever, but it kind of is really. Um, what you do is you immunise an animal against its own hormones or against its own uh, egg membrane, the zona pellucida which surrounds the egg. It's quite easy to do that. You can actually immunise but by injecting an animal with an uh, alien protein. Let, let's, let's go into the hormonal approach first. Go and add a trophin releasing hormone, you don't want to know that. That's the one that switches on all the actual reproductive hormones that you're familiar with, estrogen and testosterone and all the rest of it. They're controlled by this thing called gonadotrophin releasing hormone. And you can actually make the animal reject its own GnRH. If you inject it with a foreign GnRH, it produces antibodies, but the antibodies aren't that clever. 
They can't distinguish between one form of GnRH and another, and so they actually act against your own as well. And that act effectively means you no longer produce estrogen, you no longer ovulate. Really quite clever, actually. And the other one works on the zona pellucida, this membrane which surrounds the egg cell. And again, what you do is you inject animals with zona pellucida extract from pigs. It's bizarre. Why would you want to do I mean, think about it. Think about, think about bovine spongiforme encephalopathy for a start, which we believe probably came from feeding um, proteins of another animal to cows. Now, why would you want to inject the protein from a pig into... Anyway, you do this, and what happens is that the, because it's an alien protein, the female produces antibodies to this porcine zona pellucida, but those antibodies also act again her own, uh, her own eggs, and means that even if she is fertilised, they cannot be implanted because the womb will reject them. They're really quite, these are really quite clever approaches in theory. In practice, they are extremely expensive. In practice, they are not permitted in the UK except under experimental licence and only one organisation used to be Central Science Laboratories, it became FERRA, it is now part of the AHVLA. Um, only they have a license to use it and only for formal experimental processes. So people's idea that this was going to be the magic bullet is rather misplaced. And in addition, it in itself has ethical and welfare issues. There are actually possible problems that certainly with the uh, immunocontraception which works on blocking implantation because the female will then cycle again. So what you will actually do is you protract the period over which females are in estrus, you expand the period of the rut, males get knackered, um, they, but seriously the, the risk of serious injury increases because they become almost exhausted and yet they are still fighting over continually recycling estrus females. There are also possible problems associated, and again from a veterinary point of view, with continued suppression of uh, reproduction in females. There is some evidence it causes uh, significant damage to the ovaries and may also cause fatty degenerate because of the build-up of fat. You're not, you're not supporting a pregnancy, you're not lactating. Because of the build-up of fat, there are associated pathologies with that. So it's not the greatest solution in the book, and it's very expensive. Again, we only have information really from the United States, but in 2002, the cost of trapping and injecting 30 white-tailed deer was 1,200 US dollars per deer, and there was a more recent study in 2013, which has actually brought it down to $1,000 per deer. So it's not not to be undertaken lightly. And remember, in considering this technique at all, none of these agents is licensed for general use within the UK at all. So what I've tried to do is put some of those costs together. There was a study by Dua et al. in 2001, which is where most of, where most of these figures have come from, but I've tried to update it with that most recent figure that I've given you from Boulanger and his co-workers. Lethal control by importing sharpshooters, as they call them in the States, is clearly the cheapest option. Trained, qualified sharpshooters, these were rangers or park rangers or in some cases police marksman brought in. It was the cheapest by far and in fact probably the most effective if carried out safely. In fact you can turn it on its head because hunting as long as it is properly controlled is the only method which can actively generate revenue 
This was carried out by professionals who were paid for it. But control of urban deer populations or urban boar populations by volunteer hunters, as they call them in Europe and in the US, actually can generate income partly from the sale of uh, hunting fees but also from the sale of the meat. But the important thing, and I think probably all of you are aware of this, the important thing is that whatever you do, you have to involve the local community. Initially, it's been the repeated experience in continental Europe and in the US. Initially, people are very concerned about intervention in populations of urban ungulates. They oppose lethal control. They try and persuade managers, whoever is the responsible authority, and that in many cases is unclear, that's another issue. They try to persuade the responsible authority to go for translocations, even if not contraception, because they believe it is the most humane method. And it's only by involving, as I say, many of them are against any form of control at all. It's only by involving the community actively in discussing the fact that there are problems associated with these urban populations of wildlife, and while it may be nice to see them outside the window, they come with a price to be paid. It's only by persuading them of that and then exploring with them the costs and benefits of the different options available that you can usually get community buy-in and usually get an effective <coughs> control program underway. Many of you may know that in the Central Belt, Norman Dandy and co-workers, Norman Dandy worked at that time for the Forestry Commission for Scotland, <coughs> undertook a, a parallel analysis of how local people reacted to deer, not so much in this case in urban areas, but in the peri-urban areas, suburban areas and peri-urban fringe. And culling was initially the method least favoured by the local community. But after discussion, after realising the issues involved and realising the difficulties with any form of population control, most came round to accepting that culling would be an acceptable management alternative when other methods have been tried and have failed or have been demonstrated to be impractical. So it's the same message, get the community involved and if you do, then through dealing with facts rather than emotions, you can usually persuade them to accept that culling is currently the only effective method available, but that it needs to be carried out safely and professionally. It's only fair to tell you I've stolen most of this talk from a chapter in a book, which David's already got, uh, a book due out in August this year on the behaviour and management of ungulates in Europe. And there are some flyers on the side there. There are a number of other chapters in that book which I think might be of interest to some of you. There are chapters on how you ensure welfare in wildlife management. There are chapters on how we actually put a commercial value on wildlife, how we value wildlife in different countries of Europe, and you may find that that book is worth a look at. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your time.